of like let them look cool and stuff. Yeah. Let's see them. Maybe there's some way somebody can see them. It's a they say said something like first half of the so this one makes some interest. Yeah, it's yeah. really good kind of post company for me. We found a legend also a bunch of people. It's a little weird, but it's showing a lot of my day, a lot of my day. Of course, it means it's true, which I put it in. That's that's the thing today. That's my opinion. I was I was worried that I was so you know Yeah. 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 Is there um a sample? Yes, it's usually under the mic'd up and yes, I think mics are working. I just saw it's Keith, the AD. Uh, it's Kevin. Kevin, I knew it was a K. Yeah. He walked off with something that looked like a remote. Yeah. That's right. Hello, projection room. Could we have a, a remote? Oh, no. The slides. Do dar, please. But I don't have slides, so I can get going without them. We do need, and then I'm off to the yeah. Are you are you showing slides? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yes. Thank you. I think it's fairly straightforward. Yes. Yeah. Although I will probably mess it up because I'm not good at it. Well, it does work, and you'll, you'll get your slides on here. Yeah. Yeah, 
Do you want me to start, Sean? I think so. Megan, have we got any laggards out the out the oh, thank you? Good morning, everybody. My name is Ruth Allington. Um, I'm the current and the 111th president of the Geological Society. And I'm really delighted to have been asked to, to give you all a welcome to this UG, UG UK event today at Burlington House. The hope is that the conversations we have today and the perspectives we hear from each other will help us to make progress towards building a strategic alliance of stakeholders from across the UK geoscience sector that can work cooperatively and collaboratively to change negative per perceptions create influence and establish a widespread understanding of geosciences as key to the UK society and economy. This event has a bold aim, a call to arms to build strategic alliances across the geoscience sector that will take forward the vision for ass assuring geosciences understood as key to the future of the UK. I'd just like to say a few words while I have the floor. Um, about the historical context for the event, or one historical context for the event. On the 20th of February, 1874, the president of the Geological Society, at that time, His Grace the Duke of Argyle, who doesn't seem in the AGM to actually have a name other than His Grace the Duke of Argyle, reported that the Geological Society was seven to 10 days away from taking possessions of the main rooms at Burlington House. On the 28th of February, 2024, 150 years later, I, as president, signed the heads of terms for a 999 year lease that secures our future here after several decades of uncertainty over our tenure in this building that was built and um, fitted out for us. Um, and it's, and we've, we've been, um, grappling in the second half of the 20th century or the last last third of the 20th century and so far in the first with our landlord the government over the lease and its terms that's been largely a discussion about um revenue for the government affordability on our side and until the very last stages of the of the discussions, very little about the impact of science to society and the importance of, of our science and the, all our kindred um, sciences around the courtyard. So it's really wonderful to be hosting this important and forward-looking event in this building in this 150th year. As further context, on the 19th of February, 1875, the AGMs were always in February in those days, and it still says in our charter that they shall be in February, although that might change quite soon. John Evans Esquire, who was then the president of the Geological Society, delivered an anniversary address in which he says, when it is borne in mind that this is the first occasion on which an anniversary address has been delivered in this room, which would have been approximately in this location, but obviously not in this configuration, it will, I am sure, be felt that I cannot well do otherwise than commence my task by congratulating the society on being at last in full possession of the handsome and commodious apartments which by the liberality of Her Majesty's government have been provided for our use. We may indeed look around us with some pride at the thought of the science which we cultivate having its utility and public importance recognized in so substantial a manner as is evinced by the dedication of a building on such a scale and in such a position to her votaries. It is true that the recognition of the services which geology has rendered and is still likely to render to the state dates back to the time when upwards of 40 years ago, the government of the day allotted our, to our society the rooms 
which it has during so long a period occupied at Somerset House, and which many of us must still regard with that peculiar affection which attaches to an old home. To some few of us, no doubt, the central location of Somerset House had its advantages, but to the majority, I believe the more Western portion of Burlington House is far more convenient. Even, even were this not the case, and, and this, is, this is my word of the week, the propinquity, which I can't actually say, propinquity, in which our pre present apartments are to those of the Royal, Linnaean, Chemical and other societies, with the objects of which certain branches of geological science have much in common, ought alone to turn the scale in favour of such a change of locality as has now been effected. He goes on to talk about other locational advantages of being at Burlington House, but they're all about the imperative of collaboration, the, the proximity to collections, to opportunities to debate with other scientists and other relevant stakeholders, and particularly government. So this shines through the service to society, the need for geoscience and other sciences for society. So it feels wholly fitting that the Geological Society is hosting today's event. Um, I've got a couple of mundane things to say before I um, give the floor to, uh, to Sean and Marie. Um, the fire exits are clearly marked. There's one here, two at the back. The muster point is um, near the statue of Sir Joshua Reynolds, which is um, at the other, other corner of the um, uh, courtyard outside the um, Royal Society of Antiquaries. Or society, society of Antiquaries. Um, if you have a mobile phone, please put it on silent, but please don't turn it off because um, you, you may need to use it or you will need to use it if you wouldn't mind for the Padlet, which will be explained to you by somebody who knows how to how to do it. If um, if, if it applies to you, we do have an um, an induction loop. If you have any difficulty um, tapping into that, then um, please ask one of the uh, I, I'm going to say people with yellow lanyards, not me because I don't know how to do it, but because um, I'm not a member of staff. But there are mem members of staff around who will be able to help you with that and any other access requirement that you may 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 need. Um, I was remiss in in not in not welcoming, especially those who are online. Um, I think you probably have your um, your videos and your microphones uh, muted. Um, the Padlet will be particularly important to you, I think, in participating in the meeting, and we'll do our very, very best to help you participate fully, but there'll be somebody keeping an eye on that. So if you've got any problems with, with hearing or seeing, um, please, please let us know. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Sean. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you very much to GSL for hosting. Uh, we're really grateful for the support that the Geological Society have provided today and for their continuing support with this initiative. So, so thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. And thanks to everybody that's taken the time to join us, either here in Burlington House or online. And I do have to say that, that Becky is moderating the online here. So we've got, hopefully we've got that, that going on in, in tandem. So I'm, I'm talking to you today as the chair of University of Geoscience UK, and that's the organization that represents geoscience in higher education. Um, I want to start by acknowledging my colleagues on the UG UK executive and those who've previously been on the executive for all the work they've done um, that I will share with you today and, and towards building this vision. So today I've been tasked with giving um, a higher education perspective on the idea of building a strategic alliance in geoscience, where it came from and why it's needed. And uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Marie Cowan, is going to expand on, on this um, after I've finished. You will see, before I go on, you will see there are two, uh, there's a QR code on here. The QR code links to a Padlet. Later today, or later this morning, we have um, a question and answer session, and we'd like you to post questions onto the Padlet or comments onto the Padlet, just so that we can 
collect those. There's also um, an old school hard copy board outside that you can use if you prefer that. So I think we've all seen this fantastic poster that GSL produced that's gone out to schools and colleges all over the world. It does an amazing job at illustrating the critical and wide ranging role that geoscience has in securing a sustainable future and in giving us a chance of achieving the UN SDGs. And here's why. Uh, the slide shows some of the key skills and competencies that make geoscientists critical to the UK's science and sustainability ambitions. They are then by no means extensive, um, but I just I selected some. They're taken from the QAA Earth and Environmental Science Studies Subject Benchmark Statement, and that's a kind of quality assurance mark for degrees in England and Wales. And they also appear in the requirements for Geological Society degree accreditation. I think we'd all agree these are core skills for geoscientists, skills that are absolutely essential for a whole range of sectors, energy, water, mining, engineering, environmental protection, um, natural hazards, and many more. But there has been something of a problem in the pipeline of graduates with these core uh, geological skills due to a decline in numbers of undergraduates studying geology, geoscience, earth science. And for ease, I'm going to refer to that as geoscience today, but it acknowledges all, all those types of degrees. I'm going to show you some data about this, and then I'll bring you up to speed with what's going on now, so the current situation in universities. I'm going to share something then about what we've done um, to address this as a, and um, think about a foundation of what we could do and what we should do to ensure our future, both of our subject and quite frankly, of the planet. So um, I can't see this, the, um, the slides down here, just freedom to focus. Okay, I can see them up there, so that's good. Um, so you may have seen this graph before or something similar to it. And I thank my colleague in UG UK, Mark Anderson for um, sharing it with me. It shows the number of students who are entering geoscience degrees and data is from a, a number of sources. The red line shows data from um, UCAS, which is the University and Colleges Admission Service. And it shows the number of uh, those entering geology degrees from a period in the um, 2000 through to 2022, which is really the last um, set of data we have. The blue line is a little bit different, and it shows data from the Higher Education Statistics Agency and the Higher Education Classification of Subjects. Um, you'll see that little sort of uh, tick uh, around 2018. I do have to make you aware that at that time there was a change of the subject coding. Prior to that, you could tease out geology specifically. After that, it became part of a broader category called Earth Science that includes oceanography, meteorology. So do, do be aware of that. Uh, so that historical, tr that trend is showing that decline from um, 2012 through to the, the uh, um, almost the current day. Reasons for this have been debated and written about at length, include um, negative perceptions of geoscience, lack of understanding about what geoscience is, decline of AS levels that meant that students studying A-levels didn't that have that option to try out geology as an AS subject, uh, drop in the number of 18 year olds as a whole in terms of the population. This happened at the same time as the percentage of population going into university was growing. So there's a kind of, might be a canceling out there and um, economic challenges faced by universities. So that's um, that that's kind of the, the, the uh, the data that we have. I want you to bring you up to speed with that. We undertook, so UG, UK undertook an informal survey of our members this spring, um, and we got about 15 responses. So by no means all institutions offering geoscience, but a good proportion. And the key, the key findings are, are here. So the good news is that that drop in numbers is stabilizing. Uh, some departments have seen increases in numbers, which is great, but you have to couch it in terms of the fact that there are some courses that are already closed. But it does look like that um, 
we're, we're stabilizing with the drop in numbers. However, those inc the, there hasn't been, um, we, we haven't increased to reach those levels of students that were entering geoscience degrees in, in 2015. <clears throat> Some course closures. Uh, degrees at Nottingham, Newcastle, Brighton, University West of England, Kingston and Derby, although Derby has since reinstituted a, an earth science degree, have seen course closures. Um, a number of those are modern or post-92 universities. That's of concern because it means that maybe our subject is being restricted to certain types of universities, maybe more elite universities, which has um, issues, questions, challenges around widening access and participation and the diversity of the, the subject. We've lost some specific degrees. So Portsmouth lost their geology and geotechnics degree, Bristol, geophysics, Leicester, geology and geophysics. So that's just to give you a flavor of, of what's gone on or what, what the current status. Some trends we've seen in actually what students learn um, in geoscience degrees reduced number of residential field days, although there is still field work, it just is tending to be more local for a, a number of reasons, reduced optionality of modules for students, more environmental content and degree mergers, although often those are with environment, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, it just means that our degrees are, are changing in what they, they deliver, um, and some specialised pathways in, in geology degrees. So I just wanted to set that out to present you with our current, current state of affairs for geoscience at UK universities. But what I really want to do is focus on moving forward. So I'm going to change track here a little bit and share with you some of the things that the Geological Society and UG UK have been doing to address this. Now, I want to acknowledge that um, there are many people in the room today that have done that have been involved in all kinds of projects and initiatives, Geoscience for the Future, um, the Equator Project, Geobus Girls into Geoscience. And I just want to acknowledge all of those things that, are, that have been that are ongoing to, to, to raise awareness. And apologies if I if I've missed any. Um, I know there, there are many. The big arrow here um, points to the strategy that the Geological Society in UG UK. Uh, set up in 2020, a kind of a low point of enrollment in universities to address uh, the, the trends, the downward trends in those studying um, geology. GSL's activities have been broad in scope, um, include Geology Ambassadors program, all sorts of outreach events, uh, Science Week, the SDG poster that I'd already um, um, shared in my second slide. Uh, but I want to focus on uh, a number of things that UG UK have done. That's not to, to um, uh, diminish anything of Geological Society, but I'm here to represent UG UK as well. So just say a little bit about um, some of the things that we've done um, around university and school links, industry, influencing government and university accessibility and diversity. So um, I'm gonna say a little bit more about those. University Schools Link, um, the Teach Earth Project. So our intention was to make school children and teachers more aware of geoscience. There are very few classes in schools that are badged geoscience or geology. You won't go into a classroom and hear the teacher say, today we're going to talk about geology. Um, but geology gets taught in subjects across the curriculum, often by teachers who have no background in it. We wanted to understand where these geoscience touch points were in the curriculum and find a way to clearly badge them as such. So um, Maggie Williams, Amanda Owen and Emma Smith worked on this um, and once set up, and there's an example there of renewable and non-renewable energy sources in GCSE physics, that's just one of many. Um, and once set up, we've, we've got them uh, available through our UG UK website. So we've encouraged our members to create associated teaching materials, and then these are um, badged and presented against where they would be taught in the curriculum. So very easy for teachers to be able to use them, whether GCSE or at lower level or A level and, and by subject. And um, I want to thank Pete Rowley um, for his work on this. 
And as a shameless plug, um, we welcome contributions. We're growing that all the time. So if you're, um, well, you don't have to be an HE, you can be anywhere and want to submit resources, we're happy to have those. So that's our university schools link um, that sits alongside a lot of work that GSL are doing with schools. The next one is around an industry link uh, and the development of a degree apprenticeship. So we, we did this to provide an alternative route to completing a degree um, while able to work. It's often a choice for those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So this is a way to encourage uh, and try and support a diversity of young people into geoscience and another option to study and learn for a degree in geoscience. Paul Roberts from ACOM led um, this for industry. And we had a number of industry partners, including Atkins, Tarmac, Jacobs, Scottish Power, Cornish Lithium, Idris Consulting, Van Nuttall, as well as GSL and BGS. And Nick Core and myself were academic advisors. So the stand is in place. And I'm really pleased to say that Keele University are going to be the first provider. They have an upcoming validation. So we will have a geoscience degree apprenticeship that should be available from 2025. And hopefully there will be a greater update, but Keele are the, the are first on board. The next area was around um, accessibility and diversity. Uh, I think we're all aware that the demographics of students studying geoscience is not diverse. It's probably one of the least ethnically diverse, uh, uh, least ethnically diverse subjects, and it doesn't attract many people, many young people with disabilities. It suffers um, something of a perception of what a geologist looks like as a white, able-bodied man with a beard. And I'll point to the recent publication by Stephen Rogers and colleagues in Earth Science and Society for their, their survey and their, their presentation of, of work around that. We need our community to be diverse. We have to start with those entering the subject, start with those studying the subject. So to work towards enhancing accessibility and diversity, we've organized a series of workshops on a variety of subjects led by um, Rebecca Williams. Um, and in association with other organizations. And again, I have to stress, it's not us alone. There are many, many initiatives, many other projects that are working on um, accessibility and diversity in, in geoscience. Uh, some of the workshops that have been delivered uh, include the, the topics there, decolonizing the curriculum, virtual field work, um, anti-racism, inclusive, um, um, uh, inclusive field work. The last of our sort of four areas to, to, to focus on was influencing and raising awareness of geoscience. So this is bringing us right up to where we are now. This is where we are today. So this was thinking about how we influence outside of geoscience, how we influence outside of the, um, the echo chamber that we're in and we reach decision makers, policy makers, um, government. Myself and Nick Core, as chair and former chair of UGK, um, have been trying to make headway, headway with this. Last November, we held a UG UK event on how to engage with government, stakeholders, um, policy. Um, it became clear that this was not anything that we could do on our own. Uh, Dr. Marie Cowan, who's speaking next, gave us a very inspirational speech on the need to develop a strategic alliance across geoscience and the idea was born. And I'm very grateful to George Jameson, who's at the back of the room there, um, that took this and ran with it and offered the support for GSL. So thank you for enabling us to take this forward and be here today. So this is our vision. Um, we want to build a strategic alliance of stakeholders from across UK geoscience to work cooperatively, collaboratively, and to change negative perceptions, to create influence and establish widespread understanding of geoscience as a key to UK society, UK society and economy. Today is the first step towards that. And I thank you again all for being here to enable us to take that first step. Our key objective 
is creating that strategic alliance and acting collectively. And we have a number of actions that we hope will come out of the event today. So we want to create um, a contact list of those who are committed to involvement with the, the Alliance. Um, so if this is something you want to be involved with, please sign up to it. I think we'll have a, by lunchtime, we'll have a sign up sheet. We want to establish working groups with volunteers to act with theme leads. By the end of today, we'll have hopefully established what those look like. We want to develop key goals for the Alliance, and we want to map stakeholders with routes to accessing those stakeholders and, and how we influence them. And our workshop this afternoon is going to be focused on that. We have a couple of um, outputs that we would um, hope to achieve. One is more of a sort of short thought leadership brief on the current and future role um, and significance of ge geoscience for UK society and economy. Um, and the second is a broader report that details economic societal benefits of geoscience to the UK. And that requires a lot of input, funding, um, and a lot of collaboration for people to try and bring that together. Um, it's nothing that we can do by ourselves. So today is just the start. Uh, hopefully it builds the foundation for us to work collaboratively and collectively to ensure that future influence in geoscience. I'm gonna do a little bit of logistics now. Um, this is what we've got going on for today. So Ruth's already given us the welcome. Um, I've given you some of the background about how we got here and how UG UK um, was involved and, and um, our, our, our work with GSL. We are going to have um, a keynote next from Dr. Marie Cowan. Then we'll take a break. Then we have a panel discussion. Um, Ruth's going to moderate that. And we have um, Angela, Graham, Chris, and Joel, who will act as um, panel members. And they have a couple of questions they've been primed with ahead of time to, um, uh, to work through. And then we'll have a Q&A. And the Q&A is, is for everybody to um, have their input. We would ask that you submit your questions to our Padlet and that's the QR code for it so that we can capture those questions and comments and so that we can um, use them as we're uh, leading the Q&A session. We feel that would be the most efficient and effective way to do it. After lunch, we'll have workshops um, and Nick Core is gonna help uh, with reporting back on those workshops. I will show this again this afternoon but just to give you an idea of what we'd like to do in the workshops, our plan is for you to work in um, uh, small groups and think about stakeholders we need to work with. So who do we need to influence and why? Why should they care about geoscience? Um, how do we persuade them? How do we influence? How do we connect to them? Um, and we'd like each group to come up with at least two, two stakeholders. And then we can use that information to move forward. Okay. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Marie Cowan. And hopefully the next, there we go. Thank you very much. And uh, I hand over to you, Marie. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you to Ruth for your welcome and for Shan and Nick for the opportunity to get involved. Uh, I think my accent gives away where I'm from. Um, so maybe just a brief introduction as to perhaps why I'm here or I think why I'm here. So uh, Mary Cowan, um, a degree and PhD uh, from Geology in Queens. Um, next week marks my 20th anniversary with the British Geological Survey. Before that, I worked um, offshore uh, with an oil and gas company and with consultancy through Queens. Um, I'm a member of the Royal Irish Academy, which is I suppose, the equivalent of the Royal Society here, and I've just been elected to their council for this year. I'm also uh, a member of the Institute of Geologists for Ireland, which is recognised by mutual agreement by the JOLSOC. I see some uh, members here too in the audience. Uh, and I'm also a member of the Institute of Directors. And then in my day job, we work uh, under contract for the Northern Ireland government. So we work very closely to decision makers and politicians. And so there, there's a much shorter line and a greater understanding of how things happen. And perhaps that's why 
it may be helpful for, for our community going forward. I suppose what I want to do is for all of us today to sit our um, sectors, you know, at, at the door. But the thing that unifies us all is that we're all geoscientists or use geoscientific data and we all share an equal passion in its future success going forward. OK, so this is my only negative slide today. So all of you have been at the climate change, you know, you've seen the documentaries. You've been to the lectures, you've come out, you've gone home, you know, you've lost sleep, you've worried, you're probably suffering from climate anxiety. Um, what I want to focus is on what we can control and how we can contribute to helping the challenge that presents itself. And that's our focus for today, because we, we, we are where we are, <laughs> thanks to industrialization and, and humanity. Uh, but going forward, the only thing that can keep us motivated is that we can make a difference to reduce the degree centigrade and ensure that this planet is habitable going forward, certainly for my children, four of them, and for hopefully for their grandchildren. And I'm sure you feel the same. So that's um, that uh, helps us focus our minds on the why, basically. OK, so uh, Shan uh, gave an introduction to the sort of southward figures uh, of um, enrolments in the UK. Uh, we're not uh, exclusive. It's happening in other parts of the world. Um, the US is, ex is experiencing the same thing where they have uh, an increasing median age, basically, of geoscientists and a reduction. No thanks to perceptions of the science in relation to industry and environmental concerns, ethical concerns, and in particular in the US, diversity concerns. In fact, so much so that the National Science Foundation had to get involved and basically have a top-down diktat on how they behave themselves when it came to, to assessing bids, interviewing people, everything, line managing, the whole works. So diversity, huge issue, which again is global, but in more particular in some parts than others. And it's basically an unlocked talent. Just think of all those people out there that if they get a pathway, be it through Keele or wherever it is, uh, that are fizzing like us to make a difference, to have a public service and to contribute. So the, the um, US government has done a very nice, they produced some lovely graphics and one of which is sort of a whole um, medley of skills and how we map across the whole 360 degree spectrum. So, um, I mean, just this presentation will be made freely available afterwards. So if you want to, you know, to relax, um, this is already online. But um, so I suppose where we, 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 you know, you can see the breadth of our skills. We are literally multidisciplinary, you know, in terms of visualization, in terms of joining the dots, in terms of mapping, pattern recognition, decision making, uh, viewing the subsurface. Uh, we have so many talents and even the visualization of the data, whether it be two dimensions, three dimensions or in four dimensions, um, where we probably need, you know, where we, we hand over to the engineers and the mathematicians and the physicists. It, it's much more about programming and monitoring and um, coordination and uh, technology design and equipment. So I think I think we do very well, actually. We could say we're almost all rounded. Um, but that just gives a, a sort of a, how how can we can contribute and how beneficial we are? Uh, this is this is a, just a dovetail with chance. Is also to remind me that there are other parts of the world where this isn't happening. Uh, so, for example, in preparation for this, I've had a chat with a couple of colleagues, including the director of the British Geological Survey, Dan Condon, who's in the audience, uh, Corinna, uh, and others of our chief scientists. This isn't been experienced, for example, in Finland, some of the Scandinavian countries, or Australia. And, um, you know, it's no um, coincidence that those particular countries have a very literate population. There's an awful lot more understanding of science uh, across the population. There's a greater public debate about issues, much more robust uh, conversation um, and a appreciation, perhaps, of the contribution that industry has made and how that can be managed um, so it's not just exclusive, it's not global. Uh, so there could be some nice lessons learned that we could learn um, from others as part of our research. Um, so again, the, the British government, uh, as you know, has identified particular skills that are in shortage. And you can find a very comprehensive database, which has just been updated at the beginning of April. Um, it was, um, I suppose you could say, reprofiled to take account of migration. Uh, however, the pattern is that basically there are higher salary um, focus, basically, is what I would say is the best way of describing it. But you'll find ourselves there under code. Basically, they have it divided um, from roughly one to seven across all the different sectors. And we sit under one, which is basically professional. Uh, and so 2114 is our code. 
And on the right, you can scroll down. There's a whole list, at least two A4 pages long, of every single discipline that comes under our umbrella. Um, so I think there's certainly a recognition at the top of UK government of the value that our science brings to the country. And we're still recognised as a shortage. OK, so that's that's an important thing. To, to, um, other parts of the UK have looked at this in particular detail. I'm not sure if there's a, a GB equivalent, but I know certainly in Northern Ireland, there's a cyclic review of skills um, in terms of strategic importance and at the particular grades the country needs them going forward. So, for example, the University of Ulster produces what's called the Northern Ireland Skills Barometer. Those are the top 10 subjects in demand. Uh, almost, you know, the significant proportion of which are science and physical science ranks number three, second only, basically to engineering and maths. So that, that's a first for us. So that we took that was a lot of work and influencing behind the scenes uh, into all of the strategies. So that's brilliant. And then there's also a profile of where you have an over and under supply at the different grades, be it from GCC right up to PhD. And then they will develop policies that incentivize the creation of those spaces, be they at further education colleges or universities, to basically grow this. Okay, so that's um, just an example of how how it's managed. Um, so I suppose here, what I want to 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 encourage us all to think about is obviously we're all working in our own sectors, and um, you know bilaterally to each other. So whether you're in government working on policy options for ministers, whether you're in the UKRI community looking at research gaps and calls, whether you're in industry that is concerned about where you're going to get all of these new staff from, uh, or whether you're a profession, whether you're the Geological Society of London. Uh, but I suppose what, what I think I would like to encourage you is that this is about breaking barriers. There's no them and us, there's no sectoral, there's no Russell Group, none. Basically, this is united we stand, divided we fall. So that is, you know, the the ultimate objective is that we work together as a community. And I, I absolutely think that we can be a greater than the sum of our individual parts. And we, we know we know what the issues are. We just need to perhaps evidence and articulate those. And that's the bit that we can work on. And the good news is that that bit is not rocket science. It's achievable. OK, so it's we're all used to sustain systems approach in our job. So this is just taking the same principle and applying it to to society. OK, so Sean mentioned a um, focus on economy and society. I would include the three pillars of sustainability. So economy, um, environment and society. Um, and the first one, it'll come as no surprise, is the economy. Um, to quote an American president, is the economy stupid? It's still the economy. And even now, you know, you know the fiscal situation with the United Kingdom. This is more pressing than ever. Uh, there have been a number of economic studies done in the past quite some time ago, almost 25 plus years ago, is it time for a reassessment? Uh, there's a nice paper produced by our Swedish colleagues in uh, 2015, which basically provides a summary of all the different economic studies that have been carried out globally. So for example, it includes the British Geological Survey back in 2003. Uh, then the, the budget, for example, for the British Geological Survey was roughly 34 million and it was demonstrating 64 billion in terms of you know benefit, so that's you know just a throwaway. There are other examples, including U.S.-based geological surveys, NASA, um, other our spatial colleagues, uh, atmospheric colleagues. So it's not just you know ourselves. There are positives and benefits to the different approaches. What I would say is that just in the same way we would expect somebody to speak to us about the subsurface, I would encourage us to speak to economists about the scoping of how we do this. Uh, whether it's a pre-market engagement or whether it's a safe space in government. Um, I don't necessarily think that there is an ideal way. It needs to be ticking off economic, you know, environmental and sustainable, which historically was just exclusively focused on economic. In the past, for example, they focused on the, the net saving to the country protection from risk, whether it be catastrophic earthquake, human life, uh, erosion, you know, the cost of basically advising and protecting people from that. So that, again, is sort of the antithesis to the positivity, which is also it's just marrying that. So so that's something that we could consider. Now, uh, sometimes it's useful to look at some of our cousins in science to see how they've done it. And now before somebody puts their hand up to say they this particular one, um, yes, governments change, policies change, but up until roughly, I think, 2018, this is a very good example of how governments got together with industry and UKRI to form a collective to come up with a, 
bioeconomy strategy. And so they, you know, as you would expect, did their homework too. Um, so this was different in that it was pan-sectoral. I mean, again, not revolutionary, but ID. Um, they were able to identify 200 billion um, value to the economy, basically from, from biological sciences. They were able to identify 5.2 million jobs. Uh, this that particular study was carried out by a company called Capital Economics. Uh, and there was a there was an action program coming from this, and that was actually led. Different parts of it were led by either government, UK, or I or industry, and they had loads of lovely case studies and testimonials. It was also really good in that they focused on the infrastructure, in terms of research assets, labs, etc., but also the networks, the connectivity of the people working in the economy, and uh, the people. There was a whole. You would love this, Shan. There was a whole section basically focused on STEM, focused on higher education, focused on degrees, uh, technicians. So that was even before there was a technician concordat, which you know you're now familiar with. Um, so there was a really lovely focus on people and places. So similar, similar to geology basically has no borders. And we know because of the, the presence or absence of geology across the UK, there'll be opportunities for different things in different parts of the country. So as far as the Southeast is concerned, it's very, um, it's you know, it's agnostic. The geology is what the geology is. So the North could have some fantastic carbon capture opportunity or nuclear waste management and the South, you know, whatever. So the, the place-based approach is, is, you know, very appealing to politicians because it's across the whole area. And also it means that different parts can have uh, different USPs. And you could actually take their four strategic objectives and almost cut and paste them into us. So for example, capitalize on our existing facilities, people, structures, networks, universities to grow our, in this case, bioeconomy, maximize productivity and potential from our existing assets. Nobody would disagree with that. Deliver real measurable benefits for the UK. Again, all policy officials and ministers want the same thing and create the right societal and market conditions to allow innovation for products and services. Again, nobody would disagree with that. So there's some lovely examples, you know, that, that we can, can refer to as a basis for consideration. Um, ourselves in Northern Ireland did uh, a study. This time I was actually focused exclusively on economic value because we're part of the Department for the Economy. <laughs> uh, and this was in 2019. Had it to do it again, I would have had it wider. But basically, if we're just one devolved region of the United Kingdom, 14,000 square kilometers, 1.7 million people, which is basically the size of Manchester. In other words, very small, okay? However, all we have just in, if you take a economic benefit as the core, which is the absolute jobs that you can directly connect to natural resources, and then the, the wider secondary benefits from services and other sectors that develop around that. Um, at its core, it was 1.9 billion and 31,000 jobs. To put that in context, that's the same as the number of farmers in Northern Ireland. Anybody who knows Northern Ireland will know that basically the agri-food sector is the biggest sector and has the biggest um, presence, shall we say, politically. And so we have an equal like-for-like -like job equivalent. When you add on the various values, whether that be the professions, the consultancies, the universities, the planners, the regulators, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you almost triple it to 3.7 billion. So if that's if that's just, you know, for a small region of the UK, can you imagine what the full UK story would be? I am, before we even start off, I know that this would just be stratospheric in terms of the impact that we have. Um, and again, to anyone in the room who, you know, who's in the right place at the right time, just to give you a mini sort of uh, digression on this, this was whenever I first became director of the survey. And uh, as it happened, our new permanent secretary was a geologist actually and a fellow. And uh, as part of his introduction to everyone, he came to sort of listen and have a chat. And I said, please, can I have just one agenda item at the department's board? And when I got that chance, I didn't hit and miss. And basically he was able to help me. I didn't realize at the time by calling in the auditors. I thought, oh my goodness, this is a very, strange way to help me basically platform geosciences but in fact the auditor in her finding was you know you need to have your own science strategy and your own room to breathe and grow the sector the way you envisage as opposed to just following the legislation so if there's somebody similar in the right place either as a chief scientific advisor or reporting to a chief scientific advisor we know there are a couple of geologists who are in those positions 
and can help within the remit legitimately of your post. The sector you commission some of these things or help with time and kind. Um, you know, that this could be an even greater story for the whole of the United Kingdom. So the third uh, leg of the stool, again, is the climate crisis. You could you could just roll up in climate and environmental crisis. Uh, again, I'm not going to dwell on this because it would be an echo chamber preaching to the converted. You all know the situation. But basically, just to emphasize the, the urgency, this is literally a burning platform. This is literally a planet that is going to become so inhabitable. Um, I don't know if I need to say any more on that. If if you help, if you need to basically help in focusing uh, the so what for this. So I think I want to credit my colleague Dan Condon on this. Um, so interestingly, this paper from Science, which is pre-COVID 2019, has been downloaded almost 13 and a half thousand times. Uh, and it's a lovely paper in Science. Um, and basically at that stage, it was looking at the opportunity that ma machine learning could bring to helping understand our planet. Never mind the planets that we're visiting, our actual own planet. So if you take, for example, the US, you, we don't have the time or the luxury to send our geologists to map. So we have to do it remotely, whether it be Earth observation or other satellite systems. And this was basically coming up with a sy systematic structure in which to manage that process. So whether it be through making all of the data openly available and therefore incentivizing innovation, whether it be benchmarking and ensuring standards across the community, whether it be coming up with new methodologies and understanding the opportunities with machine learning, or whether it was in relation to geoscience and bringing it out to the wider community. And I mean, everyone, not just education, society. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a very nice framework, which you could apply to any challenge. So whatever the vision is that we want to bring to the country in terms of solutions going forward. Um, it's, just, it's just a nice example. And I'm just conscious, like for example, for my own CPD, I've signed myself up to learning as much as I can about AI this year because I feel um, sort of exposed and I know that there's an opportunity and obviously a caution, but we need to understand it fully and have a conversation. And of course, the third leg of the stool is society. And again, that you know, I don't need to tell anyone who's a member of the importance of that. Um, I suppose it's best epitomized perhaps by, you know, if you're going to your, your hairdresser or your barber or someone, you know, that you meet in the pub and they ask you what you do for a living. How is it that you actually explain, you know, so what? <laughs> what exactly do you do? So it's it's where the products and services that we provide, whether it be the maps, the reports, the data, the papers, the toolboxes, the presentations, the media engagement. Uh, the advice, whatever it is, whatever the outputs are of our work that resonates with the public, that's the bit that they will get. So at the minute, if you can imagine, even within geothermal, if somebody wants to try and find out how feasible is this, where, who do I go to talk to? This is where we need some, you know, gate posting and sign posting and collaboration to try and make this as easy as possible. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm without even um, guessing, I'm, if you went and asked a box pop to 100 people down this main street here, they could probably talk more about biology, physics, and maths than they could necessarily about geology. The the most popular of which, of course, is the, is the landscape and the holidays and the and the relationship with, you know, the emotional part. But the actual subsurface bit is out of sight, out of mind. So again, I think in this there's scope, perhaps a role for the academies. Um, so I know universities, I mean, if I was a vice chancellor, I'd be doing exactly the same. I'd be rolling up my sleeves, shortening my elbows, you know, uh, making sure I'm protecting my university. The wonderful thing about the academies is it represents all of the particular academic expertise in that area. So it's the independence is guaranteed. The peer review and the benchmarking within that community is very rigorous. And the, the profile and the gravitas in terms of engaging Decision makers, um, it needs no explanation. And again, the, the Royal Society, the British Academy for Engineering was really helpful during the shale gas debate, more recently in carbon capture. And uh, there's a nice example from the US, from the National Science Foundation, where, you know, with, with every parliament they're called in front of committees, they have at least two or if four pages of professors across all of the disciplines underneath geosciences. And just a recent table of contents, their most important focus was about a systems approach. And again, that's, you know, we're sort of behind the curve. Um, and their their big number one, two issue was diversity. So those were the two things that they brought basically to, uh, to the US government. Um, and of course, there's a focus on the research gaps. What, what more information or data do we need to basically um, 
enable the country to move forward. So I think there's also a role, whilst it's quite highbrow, I think it has its place and is very, very important. When it comes to members of the public or industry or SMEs, I know all of us are very exercised with the subsurface because that's where we live, that's where we work, that's our discipline. But for this to be the so what, we need to think about where it is on the subsurface that the fruits of your labour can be seen in the economy, in the environment, in society. So to, to think of it as a value chain approach. So for example, in Northern Ireland at the minute, there's huge scope for critical raw materials. There's a public opinion in a different direction. Uh, how we're, you were able to engage a minister recently was to look at recycling of magnets from MRIs and wind turbines, and it's producing an absolutely fantastic spin-off commercialization opportunity, which is growing from, from the university. And that was a safer space to have a conversation about resources in the circular economy that wasn't in the exploration and development and the hard part. So that when they got this bit and the jobs and the sort of the white coats and the, you know, the ribbon cutting, then this one is one that we'll save up to deal with whenever, you know, the time is right. So the same is true for anything, whether it be geothermal, whether it be nuclear waste, whether it be water protection of, um, you know, it's we we need to be thinking in this space in terms of presenting the so what of our work. So that's why we're here today, is to basically come together to sort of unify ourselves around a common cause and to do it together, most importantly. Um, and one of the recommendations that I made in November was host an event, here we are. So that's great. And because of the location, 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 I'm so glad to hear that you got your, your the rent and everything covered. Uh, that was one of the best things. This is This is where it is certainly for Westminster. Uh, I suppose I'm using the word task force because rather than, um, it is a task, it is very prescriptive. There's a beginning and an end and we know what the what success will look like. So ideally, if we can establish a task force uh, with the right people, uh, as, as Shan has outlined, that would be ideal. And that it's strategic. It's not operational, that it's strategic. That is the key word. And of course, part of that task will include research, no surprise. In this case, it's about looking at the current policy environment, be it UK, Europe, global. So taking the legislation as it stands and how we answer that, and then thinking beyond that and trying to anticipate questions that we don't even know, we don't know that we don't know yet. So that's the AI, the machine learning, the digitization, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's trying to, so that we can directly map our work into existing policy so that officials and politicians can see it and then make the case for the future. And uh, it's a high level, sort of two page or summary. Two pages is the max for the back of a taxi when somebody's going to a particular parliamentary committee. Um, and stakeholder engagement, as you would expect, I know you plan to do some stakeholder mapping and that's absolutely key. And it's 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 about the pyramid sales. It's, you know, we have, <laughs> it's about influencing the influencers, helping, you know, um, magnify our voice outside this room, outside our sector. OK, where it counts, where people have a pen, half four meeting on a Friday, identifying capital budgets that we're on a page somewhere. And of course, of course, you know, show me the money. It's about we, we can't do this. You know, uh, we can bring our time. That's pro bono. We can do that. But when it comes to actually creating some sort of a, a war chest, for want of a better word, uh, I'm just using the word crowdfund. But I know there are there's industry in the room and online. And they're, they're so exercised, they have a subsurface task force. We know they're crying out to the government in terms of, of uh, security of skills. So we could, there are precedents where you have, no, no, no contributor has any greater than a certain percentage, one seat, one vote. There's loads of models that's very democratic uh, and hopefully perhaps managed by a secretariat, not looking in any direction. Uh, the Dalsuck would be brilliant at doing that. Uh, and then we, we would have then something to go forward in terms of next steps. So one of the things that I, there's no shortage of geologists or knowledge. One of the things I think we do need to polish up as a, a discipline, as a community generally, is our public affairs engagement. So the, you know, the images, you know, no offence to anyone, but, you know, the white male, the beards, the corduroy trousers, the elbow patches, you know, the hammers, <laughs> the whatever. Uh, we need we need absolutely laser sharp um, professionalism and uh, impact when it comes to who we choose to send to bring our message to the right people. So I've done this in the past with a number of um, 
uh, communications consultancies and they have different expertises. So some of you will think of when you talk about community, going to the media, some of you think about going to the public, some will think about online. This is exclusively politically orientated. And there are there are uh, London based consultancies that have a global footprint that could bid for something like this and deliver this absolutely brilliantly for us. We would be there to steer the message and they would help advise on the, the best way to land that. So that's one, the message is absolutely key. And number two, on the consultancy. So again, I mean, I mentioned this briefly, I don't think there'd be anybody in the room would disagree with doing an economic assessment of our sector. Uh, perhaps the scoping of that needs a little bit of thought, a little bit of consultation, whether it be pre-market engagement, whether it be speaking to economists within government as a safe space, or um, this is definitely something that we need to take advice on to get the best impact but I, I would encourage you to think not just financial. So there are environmental um, accountants and consultants and the cost of not doing something as well as the benefit of doing something. So data. So this is, when we talk about data, this is, it doesn't really matter about our data. This is the data that is used to make business case decisions that goes to casework committees, that goes to government. This is the data that informs the decisions not anything that's in our papers. It's how we translate into this, okay? This is absolutely critical. And of course, part of our approach as well as being strategic and on the front foot is also to be reactive and listen. So as part of our engagement is perhaps taking on board some of the suggestions. So we need to be prepared to do that, to moderate you know, our, our, our momentum and be responsive to what the community wants. And I'm not quite sure we've done that across the whole of the UK ever. Some of us have done it bits and pieces, but have we gone out and had a national conversation about geosciences? Perhaps it's time to start one. Um, this is just one of my, you know, personal favourites, you know, just no coincidence. Uh, you know, should we have a champion for the cause? There may be a, an alternative champion. There could be, you know, this is just to create a discussion. There's obviously people in the room who could equally do this, but it's about advocacy. It's about choosing someone who is our poster person, who has the absolute and utter respect of the British public and can help us translate that into an imperative that isn't scary, but really lands and, and pulls in the heartstrings. Um, I'm sure like, well, like me, most of you have sat watching some of these documentaries and on a Sunday afternoon uh, and I end up in tears at the end. Um, and platform, our platform in Westminster, there's lots of brilliant committees parliamentary all-party groups, um, special interest groups, um, whether it be the House magazine, it's, you know, it's not hard. We, we obviously need it to, to be able to buy the space and then to book the space and it's the messaging when you get the space. So it's a multi-pronged approach. It's not just um, the economics uh, or the, the communications. It's basically making sure our information is the right place at the right time. And ideally, what we'd like, as Jan has, has said, is to produce, I'm just calling it, this could be called anything, a thought leadership paper, something, something, a bit of the flag waving that we can point to and launch and, you know, have somebody and say, you know, on this date, the community said this. So there's a marker. There's basically a critical path in our journey to say, we've listened, we've engaged. This is our, this is, you know, the community's recommendations, printed, yes. reviewed and, and published. And yeah, so this, I mean, if, if ever we needed, if if ever the, this community needed to get together, to work together for our science, for our country, for our planet, it's now. Um, if that's not how you feel, well, then perhaps you're in the wrong room. I just wanted to give you a flavor just to manage some expectations, a few examples um, in terms of the time that this takes. Um, in terms of building relationships, nurturing relationships, having conversations either formal or in corridors or at coffee or um, having meetings or um, building trust, that all takes time, whether it be with universities, with industry, with trade bodies, with global organizations. And, and to, you know, to factor that in, that we're not going to wave a magic wand. This is a program. It's going to take time. Um, and so this is just, you know, from we started trying to get geothermal on the agenda for the energy policy in Northern Ireland from 2019 through to its publication, it's three years from start to finish. And that's with, you know, <laughs> officials and scientists working together, absolutely laser focused. 
because that's, you know, policy takes time in terms of consultation, in terms of calls for evidence, in terms of review. There's a process. That's why the UK is famous for governance, because it does it so well, you know, regardless of the politicians. <laughs> it's the systems. We have a very good democratic system, but we, as long as we engage properly, uh, we can we can do that. And this is just, you know, a 10 point example of just one element of an energy policy, just one of an a la carte med medley of 10 objectives, whether it be hydrogen, biomethane, wind, you know, battery storage. This is just the geothermal from the call for evidence right through to kicking off a demonstrator again three years. It's, you know, it's a go home, go hard or go home. You know, this isn't a you're either in <laughs> or you're not. Um, and again, I think the, the profession also has a really a significant role to play. So this is an example, your, your sister organization on the island of Ireland. Again, there was a lot of public debate about minerals. Uh, because some of the scientists are within government, you're constrained because, you know, you're not in universities, you're not independent, you're part of a political system. So that's where the profession came and brought together a working group, pan-sectoral, to look at and just simply produced a, a series of fact sheets about mineral exploration from beginning right through to rehabilit rehabilitation of, a, of an award-winning uh, mine. And, and so that filled the vacuum. And in fact, then this was referred to by politicians in the Irish government. Um, and so I think that's what I would, my call would be to, to the, the JOLSOC is they have a very powerful part to play that isn't lobbying, it's still safe and it's still very valuable. I think you can find a purple patch of activity that doesn't compromise what you've signed up to. Um, so just to emphasize the role of the, and again, the academies, um, I mean, this education on the island of Ireland is, is a, a particular uh, um, topic of interest. There are, you know, there are significant differences across the island in terms of PISA uh, results. Um, just to give you an anecdotal, you know, um, the, Catholic, the nationalist Catholic community was education, education, education. So they said even in prisons, you would find Republican prisoners in the library and you would find loyalist prisoners in the gym. And that is, you know, <laughs> the most publicly accessible way of trying to describe the culture. So uh, on the island of Ireland, obviously, that's much wider. And the Academy produced a series of reports, again, working streams, chaired plenary, on different key aspects that we thought were needed to be considered that weren't being by the government on both sides. So whether it be EDI, whether it be innovation, whether it be placemaking, or, you know, what is the future of higher education? Uh, so it, there's there, there's lots of models that we can look to. Uh, and I, I declare I'm not, I'm not involved in this, but this is one that I've actually admired uh, from afar is where you basically have the Critical Minerals Association, primarily industry, but with academics and others who have galvanized and in a very organized way have done some significant influencing. Um, you know, even, you know, if you read things that are coming from, from the government in terms of strategy, in terms of media coverage, in terms of activity, in terms of initiatives, in terms of ribbon cutting, this has been absolutely instrumental, certainly in GB, I think, to moving this on. So, you know, there, there's another example in industry that we could we could model. And the geological survey similarly exercised <laughs> uh, for all of the, the previous reasons. Uh, and so 37 geological surveys are organizing themselves together as part of a pan-European project. And they have seen that they need to work together collectively to influence Europe. And they're doing that now as part of a project that's currently been delivered and led by the Dutch. Um, again, shared, shared interests with people in this room. And the approach is basically governmental focused. And in terms of communications, you know, if you want to set KPIs, just just dream 10 times more than your imagination can imagine and then add more. Um, I got involved with BGS in their press office um, 15 years ago. And at that stage, BGS was leading an uh, International Year of Planet Earth project called One Geology. And, and the, the, the scientific lead at the time really wanted this, obviously, to bring in literally every country in the world. <laughs> so the, the objective was to make sure that the world knows about this project so that all the countries sign up. Um, and in this case, uh, this, this was actually cited in nature as so significant in terms of the, the billions of people that had the opportunity to read, see and hear about it. And it was UN, you know, multilingual languages. And we even had, for example, the Russians sign up, you know, so something that you could never have a conversation about. Now, geology find a common denominator, you know, and that was really powerful. 
So I think anything is achievable if we if we decide that's what we want to do. Yeah. So again, just to, to converge back into time, I see you looking at the time, is of the essence. Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's no need for me to to, to encourage that urgency. <laughs> And yeah, thanks for listening. Um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, as part of the panel later or at uh, the coffee break. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Marie, for that inspirational talk. Um, sorry? Marie, did I say Marie? Oh. <laughs> I thought oh, I said no, Marie. I, just <laughs> <laughs> I thought I said Marie. <laughs> well, thank you both. But thank you, Marie, for that very inspirational uh, talk. Uh, we are a little bit behind time. Uh, I suggest we take a 10 minute break and start our panel discussion five minutes later than intended. So at 10 to. Thank you, everybody. And please remember to post questions to the Padlet. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm really going kind to of introduce you. Yeah. She's done her home. Sorry, yeah, I've moved to my meeting for the regular fight and fight. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I think Sean's got busy. <laughs> well, people aren't used to being in person, are they? So they're enjoying that opportunity. Um, can I ask that the, the people um, come and sit down for we, as we convene the next part of our um, our agenda? And I actually... Just wait for Ruth to come back as well. Yes. Well, yeah. So Understandably, we're, we're running a bit behind time, but I think that's because people are enjoying the opportunity to, to network and talk to each other in person. And I realize there's a lot to, uh, to, to discuss. So we'll um, move now to our next session. Don't run, Ruth, don't run. Um, so uh, we thought we'd have a, a panel discussion um, and Ruth's gonna moderate that for us and she's gonna introduce our panel members. And we posted, um, we posed two questions to our panel members. Um, how can we reimagine the future of geoscience? And what would you see as key priorities for the strategic alliance? So I'm gonna hand over to, um, to Ruth and this should take about half an hour and then we move to Q and A. So lunch will start late, but um, that's just the way it is. <laughs> it's just the way it is. We've just demonstrated between us that a coffee break takes 15 minutes no matter no matter what you do. So I'm delighted to be um, standing here with this wonderful panel beside me. Um, I'd like to just firstly introduce them to you. So here we have um, Dr. Anjana Katwa. She's an award-winning earth scientist, presenter, and advocate for a diversity in natural heritage spaces. And for over 20 years, She's been working as a learning and engagement professional in the natural heritage sector, helping people of all backgrounds understand how our planet evolved, changed and survived over 4.5 billion years. Professor Chris Jackson, that's, that must be you because you're the only one I haven't met before. Hello, Chris, <laughs> is a British geoscientist, science communicator and director of sustainable geoscience at Jacobs Engineering Group. He was previously Professor of Sustainable Geoscience at the University of Manchester, and before that held the Equinor Chair of Basin Analysis at Imperial College London. He's known for his work in geoscience, especially in the use of 3D seismic data to understand dynamic processes in sedimentary basins. Graham Goffey here um, is a Chartered Geoscientist by training, a long-standing fellow of the Geological Society, 
He was an, a trustee and treasurer between 2015 and 2021, a former director of the Oil and Gas Independence Association and a member of the Petroleum Exploration Society of Great Britain. Graham has 35 plus years of upstream oil and gas experience with companies including Conoco, Lasmo and Paladin Resources. And his career has included exploration, appraisal and development experience across the North Sea countries, Africa, Middle East, onshore Europe, Asia and Australasia. Dr. Joel Gill is an interdisciplinary geoscientist integrating natural and social science approaches to address issues relating to sustainable development and disaster risk reduction. He's been at the forefront of dialogue, student engagement and research in sustainable geoscience for the last decade and played a leading role, plays a leading role internationally in championing how geoscientists can help deliver the UN sustainable development goals. He's the lead editor of a recent book on this theme, Geosciences and the SDGs, and engages in UN forums and processes. And Dr. Marie Cowan has already introduced herself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so the question, questions we've been asked to address. Um, some of you know that I'm a, a mediator, and that's really my primary occupation these days. And what I... Um, what I notice more and more in myself and in um, parties, mediation parties, often my mediation is non-traditional. It, it may be um, more facilitative in, in terms of, of um, helping people engage with, with um, planning processes related to, to engineering and geoscience projects, most recently um, Dublin Metro, actually. Um, so I'm going to ask the panel to try and sit. What, yes, what, what I notice is that our tendency, a general tendency, is to jump to strategy, to jump to how we can fix stuff. And we find it quite difficult to stay in the imagination space and thinking about what something could be like, what it's like now. And I'm going to encourage you to sit more with the first question and the second question, so that we move then to the more, to bringing everybody in to the more strategic question. Um, I'm not banning anything or trying to, trying to influence how you, how you address the questions, but if we just have in our minds that without a vision and applying our creativity, our imaginations, no strategy could ever grow any sort of deep roots and have, have sustainability. So I'm going to um, ask you in turn to say what you think about this first question. How can we re-examine, reimagine the future of geoscience? How do you reimagine the future of geoscience? And I'm going to start with Graham. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> well, you're That's nearest. The question that I thought We've we already heard from Marie, up. so she can just recover for a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually not the question I thought we were going to be asked. Maybe I misread the, uh, yeah, I misread the, um, the uh, notes. I mean, this is quite an interesting one from someone um, who spent his life working in the petroleum industry, um, uh, which is perceived, you know, really quite negatively by quite a large portion of the population. Um, and that is something which, so I'm going to answer this quite narrowly, actually, from this perspective of petroleum. That's something which I think many, many people in, in my sector find depressing, um, dispiriting, um, when we consider ourselves providing the energy that basically powers the world and which um, which there's a growing demand at the moment. We're clearly not getting on top of demand. So if I if I think about it from the petroleum sector, mm -hmm. rather like to be perceived as not the environmental um, damages in uh, that we are perceived as and to be seen rather more constructively as you know, an, an energy that uh, an industry that is providing energy, which yes, we absolutely need to wean ourselves off. But that means the general population needs to wean itself off it. And at the moment, it's actually doing quite the opposite, and it's increasing its its demand. So, but that is a very very narrow answer to your question. But it's something that I think preoccupies a huge number of people in my mm. in my sector in the way that we are perceived. I think it's a really um, helpful place to start. It's about it's about trust and perception and um, illustrates the point that no no amount of, well, we need this, can break that 
break that sort of reputational issue. Yeah, but I, and I think also, I mean, this is the sort of pertinence of it. It, it is colouring perspectives of entire geoscience. I mean, the the the, the um one of the factors that is attributed to the decline in enrollment is perceptions of the extractive sector, petroleum and and, and minerals, which are having a negative impact on on people wanting to come to geoscience. So you know, in a sense, whilst that's a pipe dream what I've just articulated, it, we have to recognize that it is something which is coloring perceptions of people coming into the sector. Yeah. And if we can get a slightly more balanced view on that, then potentially we might at least limit some of those perceptions. And I think it's fair to say that if you look at those companies, many of those companies who are perceived as petroleum companies, they're now doing working on carbon capture and storage. They're now working on wind. In, in the UK, they're investing vast amounts of money out in the out in the North Sea, but that's not how they're perceived. So there's there's a big perception thing here, which is which is not helpful to the entirety of geoscience. Yeah, pipe pipe dream, great, love it. And John, thanks. I'm going to try and use this microphone because I have had a very bad cold. I'm actually going to um, address that question with the words of somebody else. Uh, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote a book called Braiding Sweetgrass, which was quite a seminal book that began to connect the dispirited with the spirit of nature. And these are her words from her book. In Potawatomi 101, rocks are animate, as are mountains and water and fire and places, beings that are imbued with spirit, our sacred medicines, our songs, drums, and even stories, all are animate. And I think your point about people feeling dispirited about geosciences comes from a place of emotional disconnection with the natural world, but more specifically, the geological world. And I think, Marie, you hit upon a very strong point. People can walk in these incredible natural landscapes which are fundamentally built by geology you can go to the grand canyon you can climb rocks in the peak district and you can feel the wonder of the rocks under your finger fingertips you can feel the rock underneath your feet as you're walking across it but we seem to have now moved into a state of space where we exist in a world where geology is almost invisible in our minds and in our hearts. And so the question that I've been exploring pretty much over the last three years with all sorts of different audiences from children to 90 year olds is where is that emotional connection to the geological landscape in your life around you through your generations? And what I found is quite remarkable because there is a phrase that I hear quite a lot working with natural heritage organizations is that, you know, there are certain sectors of society, different diaspora that are disconnected from nature. And actually nothing could be further from the truth because many different communities and Robin Wall Kimmerer, she's a First Nations uh, lady from North America. Different communities engage with nature and indeed geology in different ways. And I think the key word today that I would like to take away is listen. And I think if we choose to move into a space where we begin to listen to the stories and the conversations and the heritage of all of these different communities globally, as well as within the UK, we will find that actually people have very strong relationships with geology in ways that you might not expect. My mother has a piece of diorite in the Hindu temple that she keeps at home. I, I, I actually, I've, I've lived with this rock most of my life, but it was only in the last three years when I went home to, to do an event with, with a group of South Asian walkers in the Chilterns, when I was talking about having not brought a rock with me. I thought, well, can, have you got something I can borrow? It turns out my mother has like a small collection of rocks at home, but one of the most sacred rocks is in her temple and it embodies 21 different goddesses and they are all incarnations of Mother Earth. And so her relationship with geology is very different. It's a very spiritual relationship. And I think 
if we can bridge our scientific understanding of the world around us, how it's formed, what it gives us in terms of minerals and resources and all of these amazing natural gifts with this beautiful empathy and understanding and feeling that different communities across the world and different countries have, perhaps through reframing that method of engagement, we might be in a different space. Yeah, thank you. So when I hear you talk about listening, um, again, drawing on my mediation experience, having a dialogue with somebody has to start with somebody, one of the parties listening to the other. And if I listen to somebody for longer and pay attention, pay proper attention and demonstrate I'm paying proper attention for a little bit longer than is actually comfortable for me, they really want the some sort of, um, they feel an obligation to give me something back. I've given them my attention. What do they have to give? They have their attention to give. And that's when I can get my message across. So I, I think, you know, that's, you, you've told your story so, so very beautifully, but, but that really, really resonates with me. So if we can find ways of listening and engaging in communities that are perhaps unusual habitats for us, um, or even just in our local communities in, in conversation, that's when we can start um, engaging people with, with our, our version of geoscience and its importance. Thanks very much. Joel. Hi there. Um, so, oh, um, <laughs> okay. Um, that was good. Oh, okay. You've broken the equipment. <laughs> Should we move that one along? Is that, yeah. Does, does that work? Does everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, so just to preface my comments, um, my role at the moment is as lecturer in sustainable geoscience in the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Cardiff University. Um, I also lead a charity, Geology for Global Development, and we've been working uh, with students and, and others around the UK and internationally for the last decade or so, having this conversation around the future of geoscience. Um, and also perspectives have come from my time on council at Joel Sock uh, as Secretary for Foreign and External Affairs. And I think this collection of experiences has really ingrained in my mind that when we think about the future of geosciences, we can't separate that from thinking about the future of society as a whole. So we need to take a step back and look at what kind of society we want 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years down the line. And I think the sustainable development goals offer us the best, blue, uh, best blueprint for that. So yeah, there are challenges. There are major obstacles to then being achieved by 2030. If you look at the recent UN Sustainable Development Report in terms of progress towards the sustainable development goals, we are way off track with many of the targets, but they still give us the best blueprint for the type of society that we want, um, the type of society that, you know, is not just the perspectives of a few diplomats in the UN headquarters, but you know, this is the result of a major consultation exercise across a whole set of different groups and individuals and sectors around the world. Um, collectively, a policy agenda that is incredibly broad, um, but also has buy-in from all countries, you know, whether they're delivering that or not. At the, at the point of agreeing this, there was buy-in from, from all countries. And so I think the future of geoscience is really, you know, for us about thinking about how can we contribute to this society that the world has articulated? What do we need in our professional toolkit to be able to effectively contribute to that vision, that really transformational vision? There's a lot that we already do that makes a, an incredible difference. And yeah, there's a there's a, a talking exercise that we need to do in terms of you know, increasing public understanding of the value of geoscience and what geoscience can offer. But I think there are also fundamental reforms and responsibilities that we have to make, that we have to take responsibility for to make sure that our subject is well aligned to the needs of society. So for example, policy, public engagement should be part of the professional toolkit of geoscientists, understanding how to engage in that space. Interdisciplinarity, I think, is more and more a key thing that we need to do. How do we fit our geoscience alongside a set of other disciplines, not just engineering, not just the physical sciences, but also social sciences and psychology to understand why people's perceptions may sit in a certain way. So I think building a community that's fit for purpose with the professional toolkit that enables them to be at the forefront of 
delivering that transformational vision uh, is where I would like to see the, the geosciences in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Yeah. And I, I think the, the SDGs, they're very powerful as statements of very reasonable expectations of anybody in the world, and particularly in the, in the developing world where those expectations are, are absolutely not, not met. I'm going to do something wildly unlike me and actually do exactly what you told me to do, which is to <laughs> sit with my sit with my imagination and not propose solutions. Right. I think one thing that we need to think about is what sort of numbers we should be aiming for. So we continually hear about things being in crisis, graphs going down, you know, on the y axis. And I've been responsible for writing things that say geoscience is in crisis as, as well. But I, this isn't my idea. Matt Hall, who used to work for a company called Agile and Works for Equinor, once asked me on LinkedIn, he said, how many geoscientists do we need for the future? And, and I've asked that uh, several times. It never gets a positive response. People are always still very committed to returning to some historical number of geosciences required, despite the fact, as you point out, things like AI, there's huge technological advances, which mean that we now live in a very different um you know, society, you know, compared to 10 years ago, let alone, you know, 100 years ago. So do we need to train as many geoscientists, let's say, not just in terms of the curriculum content, but in totality, do we need the same number of people? Where are those projections? Not in terms of just the economic contribution geosciences makes, but also just the number of bodies we need with certain amount of skills to deliver that. And I think if we can better frame that mm -hmm. numerically, I think that then maybe we'll put us slightly at ease maybe that actually the number we've come down to is actually okay. And that's not great for university vice chancellors who like, you know, large numbers of students to train at a very high uh, fee rate. It might, you know, that might not be the future we have for geosciences. It might be, it might look very different, but let's be honest and try and get that framing, that numerical framing for the, for the challenge we have. So that's what I'd like to see happen out of this meeting, which sounds a bit dour, and uh, <laughs> I think it would be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. where, where that takes me is, is um, what's, what's the size of the geological or geoscientific workforce? Um, but when we look at education, which is the pipeline for the, for the geoscientific workforce and for the research workforce, um, obviously, that's part of the workforce, but you know, the, the, there's a bifurcation, isn't there, after, after higher education that, that goes to applied geoscience or academic mm -hmm. uh, research geoscience, and 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 some, there's obviously fuzzy, fuzzy edges. Ruth, do you have time but, for me to respond to Chris on that point? Yeah, I'll just finish my point, and then I'll Sorry, I didn't definitely come to you. I didn't mean to I will definitely to you. come to you. But then, then my mind takes me to how much geoscience should we aspire for the general population to be in, excited by, to, to, to know, to be in touch with? You know, what, what are our modern stories around connection with the earth? Yeah. Graham. Sorry, I apologize. No, no, you yeah. must apologize. It's a yeah, so a couple points, Chris. So one, yes, it is possible to do workforce modeling. That, mm -hmm. that, from Pompton Burning Burning, I spoke to an organization that, that does this. Yeah. The error bar is wide, as mm -hmm. you'd expect, particularly when you're trying to project sort of what sort of technologies may develop over the next 30 years to try to reach the next area. But it, it is it's a valuable exercise, actually, because it can demonstrate to you that actually, once you account for, for example, the natural rate of attrition of, of students who can come and study geoscience and then and then don't take that work, it may well show you that, that the level we have is below a, a meaningful floor mm -hmm. of reasonableness. I guess the other point is just a broad, broad point. What we sort of found in talking to companies in the petroleum sector is their geoscientists are some of the most versatile and most employable people in the organisation. So maybe we don't need to worry too much about the numbers and more about <laughs> coming to geoscience for the love of it. And at the end of it, even if you don't use it, your skills are very broad and applicable in many areas. Yeah. Marie. Well, I mean, I've obviously had plenty of time. Just a couple of thoughts um, on your imagination piece. So I think 
education is another side topic you could get me on. Um, one of which is the curiosity. So the the childlike, um, go back to your imagination. So there's a, a, a the, working on culture at the, at the moment with BGS and reading uh, Daniel Coy. And he basically looked at a, a number of groups, including a group of children and Harvard, you know, and MIT type people who are all given a task of basically using so many spaghetti sticks and marshmallows to construct a tower, whoever <laughs> gets the tallest tower. And actually the children were the most successful because they didn't make any assumptions. They just literally got on the ground and worked together in sort of a beehive type activity. And there was no egos and it was all very curious. And I think at the primary level, we need to try and captivate that curiosity. Uh, and then another layer to that is perhaps targeting neurodiversity as a potential greater bandwidth of representation in our science because it lends itself to the science, but it also lends itself to the critical thinking and the ethical question. So going back to the point about the capitalism, um, this is the more controversial, maybe we need to completely flip our relationship with resources. I would argue as long as you have what you need, you know, <laughs> as long as you can pay, you know, it's create sufficient taxes from the economy to deliver services, whether it be health, whether it be education, roads, potholes, you know, of course, keep the country on the road and everybody cared for. But but to appeal to more of a, a of a sense of well-being as opposed to bank balance. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, for example, I have four children, two of which are at university, one of whom basically does, she's studying for psychology, but before she picks her master, she will do an assessment of every university on their mental health strategy. And if they don't basically, you know, reach her benchmark, they're not on the shortlist. So young people today evaluate things completely differently to the way we did. We basically want a degree, whatever, a job, a house, a mortgage, you know, it's completely different. It's basically like wipe the slate clean and it's all about you have one life, you want to make the best of it. It's about your well-being and the ethics. Um, and another thing, I mean, edu on, on the education piece, I think currently our children are taught what to think and not how to think. So I think where geologists or geoscientists have the age is the critical thinking. And we could actually help other sciences and other parts of society benefit from the way we do things mm. in various dimensions. So there's something important here about intergenerational dialogue before we before we start stacking up the numbers and making the cases and, and so on. And it all comes back to inspiration and stories and, and engagement. That's where it that's where it starts. Certainly it's, that's where it started for me and I'm sure you're all the same. And Jana? I'm going to turn that slightly on its head because I've I've had quite a long career of working with um, primary and secondary school children and teachers in those environments. What I've found over the last, I would say, four to five years is your, you made a very good point in your presentation about influencing the influencers, but the influencers in this context are the parents, the grandparents, the adults and the carers, so parents and carers who have relationships with children and young people because a child will be inspired at school, they'll have a fantastic experience, they'll come home, but if that parent or carer doesn't understand the value in geology or the natural environment or what it offers to their lives, that moment to continue that journey and provide a pathway for that child to pursue that ambition is lost. So what I would argue as well is that we need to be winning the hearts and minds of the influences in those households. And, and the question I've been asking myself for the last couple of years is how do we do that? How do we win the hearts and minds, particularly with those areas of our community, those people in our communities who are so underserved and feel so, using your word, dispirited? How do we begin to show them the beauty of the stories within the geological environment? So that, that I think for me is where I am sitting at the moment is influencing the influences. Yeah, I think that's, that's so important. Did I, Joel or Chris want to say anything about that? I mean, just on a positive note in terms of getting the message out, geography doing it by stealth, and you kind of touched on the fact it kind of interview, you know, kind of intrudes on different disciplines. So the, the TV show that was on BBC Two, Pompeii, The New Dig, which had a sprinkling of volcanology in it, had two million viewers. Right. So, you know, it wasn't a geoscience focused production, it was archaeology focused, but there is 
there is some hope, I think, in trying to get our message out about the wonder of our discipline and, and not being too precious about it being woven with a human story. I think that's one thing we often say, well, you know, we need a TV show about like earthquakes or something. But actually, I, don't, I think that intersection with other bits of society and human life is a really powerful way of showing the, the value of what we do in the end, the, the interest. Uh, you know, I think, I, think, I, think there's, I think we've got to the point now where we need to, we need to yeah, not be too pure about it. Mm. Sure. Um, I mean, it's probably a good time just to put on the table because you mentioned about teaching children um, what to think rather than how to think, um, that we really need to think about a Four Nations approach when we are looking at kind of this issue. Um, so in Wales, there's been a revamp of the curricula um, and actually the, the focus is on developing skills, inquisitive skills. And it's less about content and teaching content and it's more about those fundamental skills. Um, and I think that's a really exciting development. It doesn't extend all the way through to to A level, and so there is, you know, there's going to be then this this change back to A levels before then, you know, coming to university and, and hopefully engaging again in problem led thinking. Um, but I think you know, as we explore this, the future of geoscience, the requirements of the geoscience community, what's required, the messages of stakeholders. I think understanding the, the contextual differences in in our mm -hmm. different regions, what we can learn from that, what we can learn from each other how to take that forward is going to be uh, just an important thing for us to, to have on the table. Well, I'm noticing the time. So I'm going to say thank you for launching us into the conversation and um, invite everybody else who's part of this meeting to get involved and introduce um, Becky Williams. Do you like Becky or, or Rebecca? Be oh, Becky Williams is going to moderate the Q&A. And yes, please. Yes. And could I just double check whoever's in touch with um, the online participants, can they hear the panellists? I know we've had a, a couple of glitches. If you can't, we'll try and do something about it. If you could check. No. And I think if we go until... Until one o'clock, Okay, so thank you very much. I'm going to start with questions from the public to try and give kind of equitable participation for those people who are online and who've been submitting those questions. Um, so the first one I'd like to pose to the panel, hi everybody. Um, is can we, um, and I'm going to insert the words, should we identify a small number of major unifying geoscience challenges that could act as a major long-term attractor to drive evolution of the geoscience sector? Um, the person who's raised this question says it could be a major in, uh, driver for major investment of funds for kind of unifying or underpinning infrastructure for future geosciences. Anybody? <laughs> I mean, I'll just volunteer one example that I've worked on is the GDF, the Geological Disposal Facility for Nuclear Waste, which is a nationally significant infrastructure project. And so by definition, it is agnostic of the government that's in power. It's a thing that the country is committed to delivering in which there is a substantial amount of geoscience. So I'll just say that as, you know, that is one thing. But who knows about that? Literally nobody. Right. But, you know, it's it's that sort of thing I'm thinking of maybe to the point of the questioner that there are these incredible things that are galvanizing geoscientists to deliver something over the next 150 years and yet the public awareness of it is limited grain yeah yeah it's interesting because when the we're going back to when um we're going back two or three years the geological society it was previously running these big headline events and it changed its approach to set up three or four themes which are precisely those sorts of themes i mean energy transition um Natural hazards, I think, was another. I I don't know how successful those themes have been in attracting interest um, in, through conferencing, but it's certainly something that the society had tried to reorganise its sort of external facing conferencing output towards. Yeah, there was year of mud and yeah, those all those were all kind of dropped in favour of longer running themes with a theme champion. I mean, the only one I'm really familiar with is, is the energy transition yeah. one. 
I'd actually like to pick up on that point because a few um, people have asked very similar questions actually around the the race to net zero, around climate change, um, around kind of our kind of green transition, and how can we as a community um, position ourselves as being important to to drive that ambition? Um, how can we um, engage with the public around that topic, but also and balancing the role that geoscience has to play in that against the legacy um, that we have had in being part of the, the problem that has created that and the, the ongoing role that many geoscientists still have in kind of the exploitation of, of oil and gas. And I think this kind of spoke to something that Graham picked up on earlier. So we, how do we balance that, you know, public engagement around being part of the solution against the perception that we are part of the problem? Just yeah. briefly, you know, even Friends of the Earth, for example, in Northern Ireland or or elsewhere, acknowledge that there's a huge skill set, for example, in the oil and gas mm -hmm. industry that can be reapplied to um, decarbonisation, geothermal and storage. Um, so they they acknowledge the mm -hmm. huge, you know, breadth of expertise that it, that the country has and how it basically they almost it's almost like a road to Damascus sort of, <laughs> you know, an ethical sort of transition. Um, and we're increasingly finding that a lot of people who have been involved in the industry are retiring, either diaspora who've been internationally based, coming back and then contributing their skills to some of the energy transition challenges. And 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 the their expertise is valued as presented, but for albeit a completely different reason. So they're happy to have conversations when there's a shared purpose. Um, we just go back to your, your first question about the, the pillars. There is quite a lot of alignment between US, UK and Europe, the, the 37 geological surveys on three pillars, which basically hark back to the sustainable development goals. So whether it be your, your decarbonisation piece, which I think we all agree on, very much environmental you know, protection and then hazards. So that seems to be a all prepared in isolation, a common denominator, certainly across surveys, and it's, it seems to be mirrored in funding calls. Um, but there, there's probably opportunities and challenges that if we fully understood the capability of, of machine learning and AI, that would, we could add to that in terms of solutions. There seems to be, sorry, I'm speaking to the microphone, there seems to be a parallel line of work happening in museums at the moment under the banner of decolonization where museums are looking at contested histories of objects and collections that they have, beginning to address the difficult past and the difficult histories, and then beginning to work with authentic voices, communities, to begin to retell that narrative. So it, it seems to me, I mean, I'm, I don't work in the industry, but it could be worth looking at how other sectors have, have looked at difficult scenarios and situations like like these contested histories and looking at how they've used approaches to bring in authentic voices in order to move that conversation forward into a more positive space. Well, I say positive, but you know what I mean, in a more equitable space where different voices are represent, different narratives are being represented. <clears throat> I think that's a really, really good point actually. I mean, we, so the, the hat I'm wearing here today is with the subsurface task force and, and you know, we, we and other people in the industry trying to articulate it is a really really good question the diverse the breadth of things that geoscientists are doing they may well be coming out of working in petroleum they may go work on carbon capture and storage and then go back and work on petroleum again they may be working petroleum and then in their company go across and work on wind farm siting um that if we can find other ways we, it is very hard to get cut through on that understanding but it's it's from a geoscientist perspective and from bringing people into geoscience the whole i mean i come from a pure petroleum background and we are moving so quickly into a into a domain where it's less about petroleum geoscientists and much more about energy geoscientists people who will have much broader and flexible skills who can move between these different sub applications and move quite readily between these sub applications because the steps are not that great if you're core geoscience skills, skills are, are, are developed. So yeah, finding other ways of articulating mm -hmm. that message from, with, with, with integrity and authority, yeah. I think my concern with that there goes to your point about the advocates and who's taken the message forward. Because I know the subsurface task force have redesigned, you know, and you've got a much broader brief, but it doesn't take long for a young person who's interested to go and Google the backgrounds of some of the people who engage in that and may therefore 
be hesitant towards the message that's coming out. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that the and I and the, mes I made the this, messenger is the problem. The messenger is the problem. <laughs> I made this point last year at the Aberdeen meeting, and I got terrorised for it. But I think I think I think you do need to be really conscious of yeah. of that because I think the message is really correct, yeah. but it might not be getting the traction it really deserves because of that. And therefore, how do you Going to your point, Anjana, like how do you broaden the corpus of people who are taking that message forward in an independent, sufficiently independent way to, to, to make it tractable with early career people or young people who are choosing discipline? Sorry, Joel, you, you were going to... It's a completely fair point, Chris. I think, I think it's absolutely... We can do yeah, better. Yeah. I think we can collectively do better. I'm just raising that point yeah. that at the moment we're maybe not getting the impact we... We deserve, quite frankly, from your efforts and the efforts of people in this room, because the message is, messengers are as much the problem as as the perception, things, the perception, the what we're trying to deal with. Yeah. I think just lots of these these things really link into the complexity of what's ahead of us and the challenges that we face, and I think we have to grapple with and embrace that complexity rather than trying to. So, for example, do we sum up things in a few you know a few key themes? Um, it could help in some contexts, but it could also be very exclusionary in other contexts. Um, who's the right person to step forward? Probably there are dozens of different types of people depending on who that audience is, what the, the moment is, what the message is in that sense. And I think we've got to, to really grapple with that complexity. So coming back to that strategic alliance, I think the sense in which that, that complexity needs to be there, but also the transparency around kind of, okay, who's part of this, who's involved in this, what are our different stakes in this issue? And just making sure that that is on the table, front and centre. Um, it's not in any way kind of hidden behind a public base, um, I think is really key to establishing, building, maintaining trust to be able to have difficult conversations over a long period of time with lots of different people to advance the, the shared objectives that we that we have. So different folks for different messages. So um, I'm going to pick up on, on two of those themes with some of the questions that we've had in. Um, so one of the ones is, you know, other sectors have been able to translate these major challenges into government investment. So what is the narrative? What is the questions? Who are the people to take that message to government, um, first of all? Um, and then I'm going to reflect on kind of the, the more public engagement in schools as a second follow-up question. So, Graham, I guess you've had some experience with this, with the sub first surface task forces. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know specifically what the question is alluding to. I mean, I, I and I'm not massively knowledgeable, but I, it is my understanding that, that both physics and geography were suffering from a falling interest. I mean, different factors and we're able to attract government money to kind of, and this is a very glib characterization, to, to rebrand those sciences successfully. So I, and I so do think there is potential to learn from what was done there um, in terms of how this strategic alliance thinks about what it wants from government, actually, and, and how it communicates. Um, so I think there's potential potential lessons there to be to be learned yeah i think that's the point i'll probably make in respect to that yeah yeah i was just going to just i think it needs to be multifaceted but there needs to be um yeah, an agreement about the way forward so whether it's the academies whether it's the professions whether it's the university you know collective i think if we're all working in harmony Ideally, and I mean, obviously, there there'll be times when we need to have a hard conversations or what I call the kind of dirty washing type conversations. But if we have those within the community, we all we almost have an agreement that when we're out, you know, mm -hmm. best foot forward, you know, sort of thing. So there's a control mechanism. <laughs> um, that's the the sort of the, the government uh, part of it, and um, but also a safe space for you know Chatham House type conversations. But that goes back to your different voices for different, you know, whether it's pitching at the different levels. Um, and then you're you're going to cover off your your ethics because of the inclusivity of your audiences, whether it's um, parents, children, sixth form. You, and, the, and don't forget the power of university students. We've seen them basically overturn pension investments in oil and gas at universities. 
uh, and currently doing the same with universities when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. So that's in terms of influencers. They are literally in my top right hand corner um, and they're already they've already made their commitment to their degree. So we've lost them type thing. But in terms of going forward. So, you, I mean, anybody, there's a TikTok uh, critical minerals person in the room, you know, the people are cancelled now, literally blocked. Kardashians are losing yeah, people yeah. You know, in the rate of knots over the weekend. So if the community decides to cancel you or block you or just erase you, you know, that could happen, you know, to us. So that, that's we need to be mindful of the various developments in social media going forward and, and to take that into account and have a strategy. I, I am sitting here thinking if, if we did get £10 million at the end of today, somebody said, oh, here you go, there's a benefit, what would we do with it? That's all I'm thinking of at the moment. I'm just like, OK, what would we do with it? Would we go and employ RAs? Would we make big, bigger posters? Would we shine the poster on the side of the Houses of Parliament? Like, what would you do with that money? And I think that's the ultimate thing is having those actions at the end. What would we pay for? If I, just to add, I think in terms of who who's right to take this forward, I think was the question around that. I think... One thing to throw in also is that I think we need to recognise the global context we sit in. And as the geoscience community, we have our um, you know, UK-based geoscience bodies and groups within government, but also within things like the, the Geological Society. We have things like the European Geosciences Union, AGU and others. We also have the International Union for Geological Sciences who engage with things like the International Science Council, who engage with things like UNESCO, UNDRR, UN Disaster Risk Reduction Agency, UN habitats and I think we need that body to be uh, much more effective at communicating globally the importance of geoscience to uh, to this audience working with things like the International Science Council to ensure that geoscientists are brought into those conversations in those UN agencies, UN bodies, just that eventually feeds through into what's being talked about at a national level, at a regional mm -hmm. level. So I think there's a you know, there's actions in the UK that we can take, there's actions in, in devolved legislation that we can take, but there's also actions at that UN global level uh, that we need to take because ultimately we are a subject that works internationally, we work with collaborators mm -hmm. all over the world, we've heard about challenges in the UK not being the same, mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes being the same, sometimes not being the same, but, but I think, you know, there's no way of just looking at the future of geoscience in the UK without taking that global international perspective. Thank you. So there's a few questions around um, kind of more around public engagement, um, particularly around engagement with young people. So what strategies can we employ to engage people around um, climate net zero um, and around geoscience role and destigmatizing um, geoscience and opening up that as a, an option for people? Is there scope to engage um, specifically with those who are interested in the outdoors? So, for example, through youth groups, um, through the scouts and guides and things, um, and through schools. And I know a number of you on the, the panel have got direct experiences of some of those things. So um, has anybody got any re reflections on that? I'm I'm looking at you, Angela, because I know you've done amazing work yeah. with the Girl Guides recently. Yeah, I, I, yeah it's, it's quite interesting. I think um, I'd go back to my initial point, which is listen. And I think one of the key, I think one of the key items on the agenda as you leave today should be beginning to open up pathways and channels to listen to children and young people um, and try to understand their concerns and their worries, but also their joy and excitement about the geological aspects of the natural world. And I think you know, we we already know where uh, there is a kind of a peak interest, probably in primary school, where children are absolutely and utterly fascinated by fossils and dinosaurs and paleontology is like the rock star of the geological world for children and young people. Um, but from my experience, it's all about storytelling and stories that inspire. And in having a kind of a, a two way dialogue with children and young people, about these incredible stories that are locked inside rocks, whether they're holding the oldest rock in the British Isles or whether they're holding, you know, a, a piece of lava that a lava rock that you might have picked up from, you know, an island that's like 20 years old. Rock and minerals have the power to inspire and aspire their imaginations to what is possible. So I think the key thing here is magical storytelling, lived experiences that you can bring to those children and young people about 
where you've come from and, and how geology has influenced your life. So there are amazing examples of it, the RGS. Chris is a geological superhero, aren't you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Part of that program, as are other as are others, but it's it's listening and understanding and beginning to um build those conversations. So co-creating is a magical world here, which is very much museums are leading on that at the moment, is moving into co-production and co-creating projects and programs with their audiences. This is this is really where geoscience needs to head, is listen to your audiences, work with those audiences to co-create programming, projects, outputs, whatever it might be, because then you're beginning to build that sense of ownership. I also think, I mean, I'm, I'm down with the storytelling and the, and, the, and the magical majesty of geosciences, but I also think we shouldn't be afraid to get in the trenches and actually just start talking hard numbers with students. So I've increasingly, at the end of my talks about how to get into geosciences and, you know, geology, geoscience will save the planet and all these sorts of things, to tell them what the salary is about, tell them about stability, tell them about the size of the market and put it in that context, because I think to some communities, that matters more than the kind of luxury of just doing something that's interesting but poorly paid and really volatile. So I actually show this is what, you know, engineering geologist salaries are like, you know, from Glassdoor equivalent web pages, these, you know, and I kind of go into that and show like, you know, if you want to work in a job that pays you decent cash and you need to pay the bills, this is not a bad subject to go into. And I don't, and I think we need to pull all the levers at the moment we have to try and make our discipline appealing to people and, and money feels grubby to talk about but i think i think it's i think it's a reasonable tactic yeah. i think this is some of the low-hanging fruit chris in a sense if you look at the the sort of sorts of actions that one might think will come out of this thought leadership manifesto for geoscience whatever you want to call it you know the bits that we can do ourselves under our own control going out and engaging in various forms of outreach, preparing the sort of material that either you know we can distribute or which we can be people can draw upon is comparatively low hanging fruit compared to going and talking to government to persuade them to change the O and A level uh, GCSE and A level um, um, yeah. curriculum, yeah. for example. So you know we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that that some of this stuff is easier to do yeah. than other things and and maybe a bit quicker. And also, I think. It engages people, but if we're not doing our own self help, then we're not we're not in a great position to go and talk to government if we're not if we're not doing these things ourselves anyway in a, in a comprehensive fashion. Joel, I think um, universities have a really exciting opportunity in the sense that they are place based often have that place based understanding of the the local context in terms of the geology, but also the schools and the challenges in terms of you know schools that are maybe at risk of being left behind where there's, there's less of a public engagement there. So I think, you know, I really am excited to be in a university in terms of that opportunity that comes from that. But there are two particular challenges that I found academics have. One is around the time, the workload issue, where teaching, marking, <laughs> then your research and paper writing, and then you're <laughs> scrambling around for, for time at the end for, for public engagement and outreach. And there's lots of people would love to do it, but there are workload issues. And the other thing is around funding. And actually the funding that can come along for outreach can be very short term, very kind of, you know, it's not just about the size of the money, but it's about the time in which it has to be spent. Um, and actually we need long term engagement in some in some projects because these are long term conversations, long term partnerships with schools to be able to do a co-creation of, of ideas and move it from the idea stage into the implementation stage. So I think it would be great to see you know, the full power of universities mobilised to take forward some of that public engagement work with the private sector, with the Geological Survey and others. But I think issues around workload and issues around finance and the resources to be able to do that in a sustained, long-term way, I think are, are two barriers that need to be addressed. Marie, can I take your 10 million and your question about going forward. So yes, there's loads of great examples of engagement and that's absolutely wonderful. If we imagine that the our economy here is the same equal to the biologist, so let's say for 200 billion, right? We were to even take 1% of that or even a 0.1% of that and let a contract for 2 million for a communications campaign. So basically ha have an a invite tender where companies pitch for a multifaceted communications campaign for the sector, which includes 
media, public, schools, parents, uh, public affairs, academics. And there's, it's, so it's basically um, a eclectic mix of multiple streams that involve different parts of the community. And then that's scored, however, the, the task force agree and then awarded. Obviously, you need, so we'll go back to your resources. We need some base for this activity to come from. So let's assume for talk's sake, Burlington House, <laughs> just, you know, as an example. And you had a secretariat here that was supporting this work. This is an ideal base for meetings with those sorts of companies that are based in London, that are dealing with finance companies, stock markets. Those are the types of people that we would want to be carrying this forward. So the brief for that tender can go to the community in terms of engagement. And then what, obviously there's a scoring process and then the delivery, you know, is is managed or overseen by whoever the task force is. Um, but it, it's multifaceted and it's multi-pronged, at least three to five years initially with particular objectives. And then in addition to that, uh, a similarly sized economic study led by economists, again, scoped by the community. So that we're building evidence, which will take time because there's loads of interviews, there's loads of consultation, there's loads of meetings, there's loads of surveys, town halls, you know, it, it doesn't it won't happen tomorrow. So that's going on. And uh, in and, and the communications, there's a toolbox that we share. So it is all very well also going off and given, yeah, that's wonderful. But I personally like to have some sort of consistency or benchmarking or that we all agree that this is the messaging. This is what we're all saying. It's been amplified. It's been echoed. It's been replicated. Uh, and the standard is assured across the whole community going forward. So we're all sent off to do or whoever we're talking to. And it's agreed so that there's there's a there's an element of um, quality assurance, for want of a better word. Not that I'm saying that there is any reason to think that there isn't, you know, quality, but just in terms of um, presentationally, the key messaging um, managing different, you know, um, audiences. Mm -hmm. And so it's very strategic. That's the whole point. We have the knowledge, it's the strategic bit, it's the communications expertise, it's the audience, it's the mapping, it's the exposure, it's the opening geodiplomacy. So part of it could be a UN wing, part of it could be an all party group wing. You know, it, it's it's multifaceted. And then you bring in whoever needs to be at the place for those activities across the community, because we can't all do this. You know, this needs to be shared um, and, and agreed. So I think th there are people there to help us. And it's just a, qu a question of unlocking that. If we build that vision and people listening here or online agree with that vision, I am sure there are plenty of companies who agree with how we feel. And if this, if we can assure them that this would be managed and governed appropriately and delivered, you know, specific, measurable, you know, achievable, et cetera, et cetera, then think of the power that that would unlock. Thank you. I'm just aware that there might be people in the room with questions who haven't been able to put onto the Padlet. So I'm assured that if I just... Hello, Yakuna Avatar, British Geological Survey. Um, I'm not going to make friends with my questions, but this is going to really help me to understand this event a bit better. Um, is there, so um, is there a crisis in geoscience? I, I've, we've seen declining numbers in, in universities, um, but do we see... Um, in an increased demand in industry or, or like a, in a demand in industry that can't be met with the number of people that universities produce. So going a bit back to Chris's number or I'm I'm a bit struggling with, with what what um what we're trying to sort of discuss here. And and I just wanted to, the views of the panels as to where do you think we need to focus our efforts or, and or is, is there a crisis in geoscience is perhaps my, my underlying question. So I'll just respond to that, given that it was kind of my provocation, I guess. I guess <laughs> like we talked about this a bit earlier on. Right? Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think we need to get a sense as to what the, the scale of the issue might be. But I still don't think there's any problem if we realise we're not in crisis. The numbers have stabilised. I think there's not a bad thing for us to be to convene like this anyway, to have a conversation about what we are doing, what we're not doing, what we might need to do in the future. So I think that in itself is a is a really important exercise as we reimagine what geosciences looks like. Um, from an industry, and just to add from an industrial point of view, do we struggle to hire sedimentologists, structural geologists to deliver some of the ground engineering projects that we work on, at least in Jacobs, in my experience? No, I don't, I, I don't see that. So I see the graphs for higher education intake, but I haven't sensed that in the industry. Yeah. Um, okay, so maybe 
not just is there a crisis in geoscience, but but globally, where do we stand? Okay, and I think some of the statistics around, for example, um, so bear with me. By uh, in with current trends, five hundred seventy-five million people will still be living in extreme poverty. At current pace, six hundred sixty million people will lack access to electricity. Close to two billion people rely on polluting fuels by twenty thirty. Achieving universal coverage of drinking water and by 2030 will require us to, to go six times faster than we are in terms of implementation. So there are huge challenges that the world faces and business as usual isn't sufficient for us to, to tackle those challenges. So, you know, however many geoscientists we might feel we need in the UK now, we've got to look at these global challenges, this global perspective and recognize that we've got to be doing some things differently. So that might be around more geoscientists. It might be around geoscientists who are in the room when I've been in that context where they've been talking about the future of cities and everything has been about the surface <laughs> without any reference to the subsurface <laughs> because we would great up into EGU and AGU, but we don't turn up to the conferences where these sustainability challenges are talked about. So there are a whole set of ways by which we've got to look at our community and determine is business as usual going to get us to this point where we can implement this this vision 2030 whenever that's delivered no okay so we can't change everything but there are certain things that we can do as a community that will enable us to ensure that our science our understanding is you know better access better used by others who are part of that sustainability dialogue and that's where i think there is a crisis so, uh, geoscientists are not in the room and not engaged in those spaces and there's an opportunity for us to make changes that will enable that to happen. I saw another hand up. Thank you. My name's Tristan Asper. I'm recently left a 30 year career in the oil and gas industry with ESSO and, and Nexon Mobile. Um, I wanted to just briefly build on what you said there. There was this conversation about are we in geoscience crisis or not? And, and this may be a more materialistic expansion of your own comment because i totally agree with the thought that we shouldn't just think about the needs societal needs of the uk the global sdg goals have a huge pull for geoscientists i've traveled the world in my oil and gas predominantly oil and gas career you you cannot go to a major basin without you know, running into a a driller from scotland or a, a geophysicist from wales or or, or the uk uh, england other parts of the uk we have by building an industry primarily for the north sea in the 70s and 80s develop companies that have brought economic benefit far beyond that. So couldn't part of our economic pitch, for want of a better word, to government be, you can build an industry here, not just to, to meet exactly the number of geoscientists that we might need for the UK's own needs, but build an industry that can export its talents and skills and bring in precious foreign revenue all around the, all around the world, as I would argue our oil and gas industry has done, uh, particularly the service sector, that supports that industry, and um, you look at Danish wind industry that, that is exported around the world. So our ambition could be a lot higher, I think, than just what we need for our own economic needs. Does anyone want to pass comment or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, you're talking about basically supply chain, aren't you? And, and a, a world class supply chain that, as you say, is is present all around the world. And you know, the petroleum industry is in this phase of flux where. Bunch of companies are going into into CCS, which is going to be a very steep learning curve, technically, particularly from the subsurface perspective. Absolutely, there's a there's a there's going to be demand for those sorts of skills and technologies if we can get on top of it um, and and build that build that knowledge. One of the points to, to the original question actually was from a sort of energy sector perspective. The, the subsurface task force put out reports saying we see a crisis in geoscience. Um, here's our view from the energy sector. And there's a slightly forward-looking element to it, which is we see two things going. One is dramatic collapse in output of postgraduates. We tend to take in just postgraduates. At the same time as the workforce is aging dramatically. I mean, I'm, I'm almost 60 and I'm just only a few years over the average average age of a, of a geoscientist in the North Sea workforce. So there's this huge demographic bulge. We've been talking about it for years. It's almost all retired now, and then the, then the distribution is flat. So we talk about this crisis. There is a forward-looking element, which is that these people are all going to leave the industry, and there's this flat distribution behind, which is unlikely to have sufficient skills for what we want to do, particularly in terms of, of building CCUS out, as, as well as if there's a 
political and societal acceptance ticking over the North Sea while we, or we kind of keep that supply chain to build up mm. over the next couple of decades. And that, none of that is inconsistent with net zero targets and, and you know, why, because North Sea production is winding down anyway. So, yeah, so there is, I think there is a crisis looming in some respects mm. in the energy sector might be a better way of describing it. Thank you, Graham. I'm going to squeeze in one more question before we close. Hi, um, my name's Jess Johnson. I'm here uh, representing the British Geophysical Association. Um, we recently, we're actually having a meeting on Friday to talk about exactly some of these things and geophysics specifically. And we recently did a survey of various stakeholders. And um, I just want to bring two points. Um, first of all, in terms of the crisis, we had um, about 50 companies answer our industrial in our industry survey. And um, from a range of big multinational companies down to micro companies, um, about 80% said that there was going to be an increasing need for geoscientists or geophysicists specifically. Um, and um, what and 50% said they are now struggling to fill existing roles. Um, and they are looking to physicists, mathematicians, um, people who have done alternative degrees and they're skilling them up in-house and that is that is a certain amount of uh that's a um a, that what they have what they have to do it costs money costs time and if you ask them if they would prefer to have geophysicists all of them say yes we would prefer to have somebody who has graduated from a geophysics degree but there aren't so we're doing this instead um, the other point I wanted to make was that um, in our surveys of school children, teachers and um, uh, current university uh, students, not just geophysicists, um, the environment, interestingly, was not um, a strong influencing factor in the A-levels and the degrees that they choose. The career options were. And it seems to be that um, the students want, uh, they would prefer to have a clear path to a job. Mm -hmm. And geography is now not in the top 10 um, A-levels chosen for the first time ever. It's IT, it's business, it's economics, because they can see the job that they're going to get. Now, I think one of the things we really have to work on as a community is making the fact that you get all these transferable skills um, the fact that you can go into so many different professions attractive um, and that is also going to reach the the sort of the hidden that the it's going to address EDI issues as well because it's great that we're talking about the people that already have a passion for going outside going for walks in the Chilterns and everything but there's a group of inner city lower economic people who don't have that connection to geology it's a privilege to be able to go for walks to get outside and um you know if we can make geology or geosciences attractive for um the people who don't have a connection with rocks and show them that you can you don't have to be a, a just or oil activist to want to do this you can go into insurance you can go into business whatever because you've got those transferable skills that's why i think we're going to capture people questions. <laughs> no, thank you very much and i think we're going to end on on that comment because i think i've run over my extended time um we do have a really active chat on the padlet so i'd really encourage people to engage with that but i also understand we have um a flip chart and sticky notes kind of scattered around in, in the library um, so please note your comments, but also I'm really hoping this is going to generate um, some really lively um, discussion kind of over lunch and then going into the workshops. So I'll hand over to you, Sean. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, um, Becky. So if you didn't get a chance to uh, uh, comment or you have a question that we didn't get to, then then please put it on the Padlet or the, the, the board outside um, because we want to continue this obviously beyond um, today. It's one o'clock now. Um, we were due to finish lunch at 1.30. Is everybody okay with a half hour of a lunch? And we'll come back here at 1.30 and then we'll split into groups and do some workshopping. Our, our focus is, was, is going to be around stakeholders. If you go off piste, I think that's okay because I think there's a lot of discussion and different people have different perspectives and expertise. But I'll, I'll, we'll come back and do an explanation then it'll just be five minutes and then we'll split into groups thank you thanks becky and thanks the panelists
Yeah. Thank you very much to all our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And then there's just one more thing to say that those in the room can can leave. And I just wanted to to talk to those who are online because we're finishing our online session now. Yeah. So thanks to all of you who who joined. Um, if you have stuff you want to say, please put it on the padlet, and we'll be accessing that. But thank you very much for your participation online. Yeah, it, was, it was at least even everyone was in the yeah, same yeah, situation. Yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs>